It's a going. This is Chris and Jared. <laughs> this is Jared. Sorry. He's got a little bit of piano. Yeah, I got some piano in the background. I'll mute. <laughs> he's gonna be trying to to mute it a little bit, and but he's gonna be helping me comment some more on this uh, Rod Meldrum stuff that's going on. Rod Meldrum's gonna be going back on Mormon stories. I heard actually directly from Steve. I don't know how to say Steve's last name. Pinecker. He's probably said it on his channel several times from Mormon book reviews. And Steve's also going on uh, Mormon stories, I think next week. And he'll do, I guess, two days, what John does with people across time to talk with John about how he gets his interviews and stuff. He says that uh, John's um, curious about how he gets all of his interviews from inside and outside of Mormonism. And uh, it's not very curious to me because <laughs> I can see why uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious that, that Steve's a more objective guy and the wind's got his yeah. channels. Does he not berate them and flog them morally for their? <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Uh, he's pretty. He's pretty objective and listens to him. But that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this because Steve told me that I should listen to uh, his Thomas Murphy interview, which Delin brought up several times in the uh, in the Meldrum interview. The um, struggle session that he put him through. The struggle session, yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> It's, I mean, that's a bit intense because it's not like a full on struggle session, but it's a struggle session. I don't know. No, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty intense. Um, they don't let him, it's like, he was just trying to, he's, he's not very quick on his feet. So he's not good at doing the gotcha moment. He was really trying to corner Rod though. That's absolutely how I saw it too. Um, Steve told me that Rod felt that it was a fair interview. Um, I don't, I don't think it was, but I think the reason Rod might feel that is because I do think he navigated it well enough. And, uh, then when Steve told me I should check out this other thing, I was thinking like, does this guy have some sort of sneaky racism back there that I don't know about? Like, is there something in his books? Is there, is there, he seems perfectly normal beyond kind of at, probably at one point in his life, believing the whole entire book of Mormon type line of stuff that, that, uh, ex Mormons harp on so much. But I think yeah. he's just pretty average, average uh, Mormon type with that, who's uh, reconciled it over time and doesn't believe it exactly how maybe Mormons of the 1850s believed it. Who even knows what they believed? But there was nothing weird. There was nothing weird in it. So that's why I wanted to to pull up. Yeah, um, John, was, he kind of clearly just he mentioned something in there about how these uh, <clears throat> what are the Heartland theory people? He's heard they're racist a lot. Yeah. And then he devoted the entire second segment to just chastising this guy about racism. <laughs> he brought him on there because he wanted it. Oh, I didn't know this would get brought up to rate. You knew racism was going to get brought up, dude. Come on. That's what the whole point was. And they just did it for two and a half hours. And now they, I, they probably could have gotten done what they were going to do now in that same episode, but they didn't get to it because they had to do that whole performative, I'm not a racist, I'm John DeLynn, the race savior type situation. Uh, I, I wanted to hear that. The only reason I tuned into it is because I wanted to hear the Heartland theory because it sounds wacky. Yeah. Well, so this is uh, Mormon book reviews, Mormon book reviews with, uh, with uh, Stephen. I don't know if you go by Stephen or Steve, Stephen, but um, he talks to me uh, a little bit on... Um, some direct messages and he is the one who actually set up Rodney going on John Dillon's show. So he had this person, Thomas Murphy, and each one of them says they're responding. Rod Meldrum's responding to Thomas Murphy. Thomas Murphy's responding to Rod Meldrum. Rod, Thomas Murphy is an anthropologist who works with native Americans and an, is an academic and all that stuff. I have this fast forward to a moment in the whole episode. If you see over here on the side here, this is the Rod Meldrum episode. And this, I bet you even after the DeLynn episode, this will be a better review of what Rod Meldrum actually believes himself. You know what I mean? Because he actually- They didn't really talk. say anything about what he believes. They just, he was like, these racist things were taught. Do you believe them? And he's like, I don't know what the explanation of that was. So I think I've got it zoomed in on what it is right here for just a couple minutes. And I don't think you'll know any much better if you just hear the couple minutes. And I'll try to explain it after. But he he explains his whole Heartland theory here, and you wouldn't pick up on that right away either. What's supposedly racist about it? But let's listen to what uh, Thomas Murphy's critiques are. I would say that when 
the poor quality of Meldrum's work in the area of my expertise, which is anthropology, makes me quite suspicious of his and Dean Sessions' claims about a universal model. And I don't have the time to go into all of that here, but if the Heartland, community, Heartland group wants the scientific community to take them seriously, then they need to begin to apply some basic ethical standards to their research. Stop promoting known frauds. Stop looting archeological sites. Stop pandering to racial prejudice and white nationalism of their audiences. That would be a good first step. In so, so it's a little bit strange to me in this one as well that he had some other points earlier about why he thinks it can get racist, but he brings up that Rod brings on Native American Mormons. Like he has Native American Native speakers at his conferences. Um, well, so it, so the Heartland theory, the whole his whole thing is that the Book of Mormon took place in North America, right? Yeah, kind of more around the Great Lakes area type stuff. All the explanations are Great Lake explanations. So it's just kind of trying to make sense of the geography in a different way. It's weird that somebody would try to bring up ethical concerns. I feel like just practical. Exactly. <laughs> there's no and, metal, there's no civilizations. You're, you're hitting on the entire reason I felt like I had to make a follow-up on it, which uh, we'll let it play out here a little bit. All right. Engaging in dialogue with, with the scientific community. And I want to make my final critique. I want to speak more religiously than scientifically. Okay. Okay. You know, just one last thing too. You know, you had said yeah. earlier that, you know, it's racist, you know, and I, I want to make it clear. I don't, I think what you're saying is Rod Meldrum isn't necessarily a racist, that he is spouting views that he is unaware of being racist. Would that be a, a better way of putting it? I think that's the way I framed it. Okay. okay yeah. I just so, want to clarify. Steve, Steve's such a good interviewer. I mean, he's so good at letting people talk, but then he like clarifies the right things. You know, you know listen to what, what I'm saying carefully. I yeah, chose I think, my words very carefully. Yeah, I believe, yeah, the you argument, have. The arguments that Meldrum uh, has made are racist. That's what I've said. Exactly. I think that's good that we have that clarification. That's good. Yeah. All right. And. I swear Delin used to be a good interviewer. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's part of the point. Uh, from the start of me starting my channel, oh, by the way, this is Jared Higdon. You might have seen him with me on uh, Jonathan Streeter's uh, channel. We're all kind of going over some of these uh, cynical theories things. You're probably going to get back into podcasting. You and your wife doing right now, right? Uh, I, I mean, that's my wife's channel. Most I, I'll go on there. With her, but that's really her baby. I don't, I don't really talk about any of this stuff on there. But um, you're but, thinking of, you're thinking about getting yeah. back into it too. Yeah. That, I need to, that I need to cool. start it. I, I had a channel a while back that I did a couple things on and I think I want to start it back up. So Jared's uh pretty good at uh, uh zinging stuff, not to put pressure on him here, but I was I mean he's seen these different ideas. One of the reasons uh Jonathan wanted him on is uh some of his comic takes on stuff, but um whatever said on here or not, some of the stuff he does in threads is I'd say it's comic, but it's in a way that should make people think about what their positions are. And he saw some of the stuff uh, in this Red Rodney thing that I was seeing. And so I said, hey, I'm flipping, flipping Kevin. We're, we're both busy. So I said, hey, jump on. And he's good enough to do it while his wife's playing the piano. So I apologize if you got to hear the piano, but that's, that's what we got to listen through to get Jared on. So. Well, it's just kind of funny. You, you brought up that. I, I don't know Steve at all, um, but you, you were bringing up the fact that he's a good interviewer. And so it was interesting to me. My favorite Mormon stories episodes were always the ones with the apologists on, because I think a lot of apologists' arguments are crazy. Yeah. And one of the first ones I ever listened to was Brian Hales. And so I'm trying, I'm comparing that one to the, to the uh, Rodney uh, Meldrum one. During the, the Brian Hales interview, he, he makes so many absurd claims out of out of thin air and, and John Dillon kind of just lets him do it and he'll direct him sometimes and be like well some people might say this in response to that but you let the points hang out there you let the points be themselves yeah yeah but if it were John Dillon 2022 doing a Brian Hales thing because his whole thing is polygamy if he was interviewing Brian Hales he would spend an entire hour chastising him for his misogynist the normalization of misogynistic uh heterocentric, whatever. That's partially because I'm sure he's heard tons of pushback 
from the leftist side of his, his listeners who say that, how dare you give a platform to a person and not chastise him? As we've seen happen so many different times in so many different places. He knows he has to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I use the example, I was talking to my wife about it earlier. It's just like, it, it's insane to me that you bring these people on, you know, they have views that you might find crazy. That's the whole reason you have them on. They're fascinating. We watch documentaries all the time about killers, like you get death row inmates and you interview them and be like, what went through your mind when you killed all those people? And you don't yeah. chew them out for killing people because it's just implied. I don't have to tell them like, hey, I would never kill someone because <laughs> and that's what it felt like when at the end of that Rod Melzer one, when John Delaney stopped him and said, we need to just stop right here and denounce racism. It was Can like, we do that. Can we do that as a group? Let's hold hands and do it. I know, I know. Well, it was like I swear to God, Kara looked at it. I was like, "What the, what the hell, man?" Yeah, duh. of course. But it's, it's so I've been performative. Doing this racist all day. Of course, it's, I'm against. Racism. It's so performative on top of that. Like even just the yeah. tone he takes with it. It's we we always make fun of like general conference or whatever that they take tones when they want to be spiritual or whatever. But that's the same tone take, and there's like this performative. I think we need to denounce. Racism in all its forms. Racism is super harmful. <laughs> super. All right. So that, I think there's a little bit more of this one. But the reason I picked, picked out this point in it, because he goes through a whole lot of other stuff. But this is like, you can see he's reading his direct response of his very specific thing about Rodney. The Heartland model that I've reviewed does not live up to the basic morals and ethics I learned growing up as a Mormon and as a Christian. So th this is part of, he says that he's getting into the religious ethical part now, but if you listen back, rewind back to earlier, he started with ethics too. They're both ethical claims. Neither one of them were scientific claims where I know he has the training and, and even gets into some of the empirical problems, the historical problems, the logistical problems. And to me, so much of what, post-Mormonism used to be was getting into the nitty-gritty of those logistical or historical problems with it with some claim you know now it's all got to turn to the ethical it's all got to turn to the activistic and even him right here when he's doing this this professor both of his claims in this read out statement are ethical claims they're not I'm sure there's plenty to take down about the Heartland model I'm sure there's plenty even Mormons would take down about the Heartland model you know and this is still just all just ethical when it gets to his read out problem with it. It's all racist. It almost sounds like it was like he's reading it. Like, did he pay Robin D'Angelo forty thousand dollars to write this for him or something? Perfect. Yeah, that's what we're, we're going to get into that in just one sec. <laughs> I learned to value truth, honesty, and integrity. The use of fraudulent materials, the misrepresentations of the archaeological record, then inaccurate portrayals of science. The blaming the ancestors of Native Americans for an ancient Holocaust that never occurred and the firm foundation's pretense of indigenous research do not live up to the moral standards of honesty and integrity. So it's basically, there's not any ounce of difference in Rodney Meldrum's problems than the problems with the Book of Mormon. You know, he didn't invent something new and they're saying, well, it's racist. Here's, here's the kicker. Here's the uh, punchline. The reason supposedly this one is more racist is because it makes the Book of Mormon even more American. That's, uh, what, that's the whole thing of it. You know, that's the only reason his is a little bit more racist is it might make you a little bit more nationalistic. They say that, that they've pandered to that in some places. I haven't seen evidence of it, but at the same time, I, the way these people think everything's a dog whistle, I, I, I'd be curious to see what it is or not. They, they clearly don't understand that you're supposed to have collective shame, but not collective pride. So <laughs> exactly. And so, uh, um, he gets into that here. It's like so much uh, of the self lashing the same way. And then saying that just thinking any part of the book of Mormon was true, even if it's your religiously held belief is bad and white supremacist and nationalistic. And then he also goes off later, I mean, take my word for it, but come watch the, watch Steve's episode he also talks about oh but the religions of these native americans were so great you know this noble savage stuff they're, they're way more open they're way more this and that and they're they're the good ones you know one of the angles i always push on all of this between rfm or or delin and all that stuff is that if it's all logical positivism which is just hard your five senses scientific empiricism 
for the Mormons. It's got to be all that too for the Native Americans. It's got to be all that too for the postmodernists. Well, like, we kind of got into that with the in Jonathan's video where you you kind of explain that you know postmodernism post postmodernism has that idea in it that like no one culture could possibly be superior to another because you have obviously you're radically skeptical. You have no way of knowing that's superior to other ways of knowing. But then you get into po post-colonial theory and the applied modernism and it's all of a sudden well yeah that's the case that no one culture is superior to another except for uh except for western the, except <laughs> western. That, well as the western's the bad one we can choose which one's the yeah. bad one james Lindsay made the joke because he has this whole entire thing if you ever want to drive yourself crazy about saying that postmodernists believe two plus two equals five and then there are a ton of postmodern mathematicians who make all these excuses for why two plus two equals five. And then it actually plays out to this point that two plus two is actually anything but four because four is the oppressive answer. And, and that's, that's a little bit of a perspective of how their mindset is. Whatever's marginal or the different is, should now be uplifted instead of like Foucault might've been more, they're all equally whatever. I even think back to those postmodernists has kind of started that the underdog had some sort of benevolence, but. So it's like if, if boomers, instead of giving us all participation trophies, they gave everybody that lost a trophy and flogged the person who won. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, all that's right. the essence of the whole entire thing. So I thought I, that we could turn to some native Americans for some ideas on some. So this is native Liberty. He's a, he's a really good podcaster. He doesn't do it often enough, but I think it's cause he's real busy, but he's actually read a ton of the postmodernism and, and all those concepts. This is him covering some Robin D'Angelo. You've read a bunch of the Robin D'Angelo and he's covering some of it here, but he's also going to get into the, uh, Thomas Murphy talked about that, that Rodney Meldrum plays into white supremacy and he gets into when academics talk about white supremacy. They aren't talking about it the same way that we maybe grew up thinking what white supremacy is. It's, it's more of that construct, constructual construct place, you know? They want it both ways. That was, that's I, true. I brought out my D'Angelo and was brushing through it. And this is, I got, this thing is more annotated than any Bible I ever owned. And <laughs> half of the criticisms are like, she, she seems to, it's not just her, but she wants to simultaneously demonize and normalize racism. Yes, exactly. Just being racist doesn't mean you're a bad person. Everyone's racist, but she knows that's not how society views racism. Well, there's this, this whole level that you want to push the conflict, the conflict theory. You want to bring about the tension because that tension will help us work through it, which is a Marxist concept. Let's listen to him though real quick. And he's a Native American. I think he's Hopi. Many people wrongly believe that when a news anchor or an academic uses the phrase white supremacy, that they are only referring to those no good people, those no good Republicans, those deplorables. And I'm here to tell you, no, what they are referring to is you. And even if you take away the explicit accusation of white supremacy, that the media is directing against certain individuals, the implications of this charge still refer back to you. Now, I realize that this is an extremely controversial claim and that I need to back this up with evidence. So allow me to elaborate upon this and back up my claim by using the term white supremacy as they employ it to demonstrate why this is true. And to accomplish this, I'm going to quote from multiple sources, including Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, which interestingly enough, the forward to her book is written by none other than Michael Eric Dyson. If you followed him at all. I, he is one of the most irritating people <laughs> I've ever listened to in my life. I didn't even realize until I picked the book back up today to look at it. I was like, oh God, I didn't realize it was him that wrote the forward. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny as you start realizing that you know who's who and figuring out what's what. And, and He's what the one that called Peterson a mean white man, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, I thought so. Mean mad white man, yeah. Now before I begin, I need to clarify. I realize that sometimes the media, when it uses the term white supremacy, 
is referring to concrete cases, specific groups and organizations that uphold the actual tenets and beliefs of. Yeah, sometimes it's the real thing. Sometimes it's not, but especially when you're listening to academics, watch out, even especially in anthropology and sociology fields. Well, the humanities. White supremacy. However, many times and in these instances and in others, that is not what they are referring to. And part of the confusion surrounding this term is, I believe, on purpose, which is another video in itself. But to be brief, it is to manipulate the viewer into accepting a frame, a slanderous frame that falsely equates an entire political party as morally evil. And in so doing, or, or a general religion, this is the thing that's, that's hard about it is there's definitely concepts. I'm sure, you know, you, you're an ex Mormon, correct? That's, that's out in yeah. the open. Yeah. Um, that there was times with all the sorts of stuff that I had problems and issues with the, uh, that history in Mormonism. And so it's, it's not like I'm saying it at all I, in my, my early twenties, you know, one of the reasons I left, I, well, they, I, I say they were more empirical, but then I also kind of fell into the, uh, Foucauldian line a little bit too, that I thought it was all just a power, um, struggle game, but they weren't these big moralistic things like. I always had an issue with the, uh, the history of racism. I was like, that stuff's all weird. I didn't have to deal with it much. I think I would have had to deal with it more if like I'd served my mission in Georgia or something like that. Yeah. I went, I mean, I went to Brazil and that was the first time I had heard the, the whole hypothesis, um, that black people have black skin because they were less valiant or something. And, and I remember that bugged the hell out of me. Um, but it at the same time like that one was pretty easy to be like yeah those guys were wrong because the church itself doesn't actually say that well one of the problems they always have to deal with the, the this is one of the nietzschean points is that these religions give themselves the morals which are the saw to cut yourself out of the tree with like mormonism gave me the morals to find problem with that you know the mormonism i grew up with um it's really good at picking apart other forms of Christianity, and then when you turn it around on, on Mormonism. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, that's, like, the, that's my issue with postmodernism, too. It's almost the same way. It's like you, you give yourself the thing that, that can tear down all the other things, and then you turn it on itself, and you're like, whoa, maybe that's, that's anything that becomes hyper-moralistic. This confusion over this term forces upon the viewer a false binary framework of good versus evil. Us versus them, the political party of righteousness, justice, and progress versus the side of bigotry, backwardness, and moral revulsion, which brings us back to the original question, what do they mean by this term white supremacy? And to answer that question, I now turn to the experts on this subject. And in Robin DiAngelo's book, White Fragility, chapter three, which is called Racism and White Supremacy, she says this, for sociologists and those involved in current racial justice movements, white supremacy is a descriptive and useful term to capture the all-encompassing centrality and assumed superiority of people defined and perceived as white and the practices based on this assumption. White supremacy in this context does not refer to individual white people and their individual intentions or actions but to an overarching political, economic, and social system of domination. So what is D'Angelo saying? What she's saying is that white supremacy is a system and does not refer to individual white people. That's explicit within her definition. And since this is a system and you are part of that system, then this is referring to you. She is referring to your complicity in upholding a racist system, a structure called white supremacy that maintains white equilibrium, white advantage, white solidarity, and white privilege. This means that this term white supremacy. So one of the points he makes in that too, a little bit later, there's only a couple other clips I wanted to pull from it, but he's also talking about Native Americans, even Latin Americans under direct critical race theory themselves get called white adjacent. I love the whole 
that was a John Delenn thing during the whole Brad Wilcox month that he spent. Systems, not people. Systems, not people. And, and it, it's kind of a good way, way to ruin, well, a lot of things, but art. That's, you know, my big thing is it, it makes me think if I posted, um, I'm, I'm a big Killers fan. And oh, Brandon nice. Flowers is Mormon, right? And their yeah. their last album was pretty good. And I posted this song in one of the ex-Mormon groups. And I was like, you know what? Ex-Mormons usually don't give a shit about art, but hey, maybe they will in this case. And and then there's a lyric in there where I was like, this seems very profound. It seems like he's talking about a guy, probably not himself, but a guy who's going through some sort of a faith crisis. And he's got that line. It sounds very Mormon where he says, they've got their castles or they've got their sites set way up high where there might be many mansions. But when I look up, all I see is sky. And it's, you know, it's a guy having doubts mm. and stuff. And I was like, that's very pretty. And one of the, <laughs> like, I only got a couple comments on it and they were both like, yeah, I've always been very troubled with Brennan flowers as to how he can be complicit <laughs> in, in such a homophobic organization. I was like, it goes awesome. straight to that. I keep trying to like make these cases, like I'm going to make it all come together in the end, but it's, it's not, I'm not elegant enough for that. So I'm just going to start saying them even though we'll get to it. So that's a bit of what the point that, that I'm making here is, is that they, these moralistic things break apart truth from truth from activism. And so when it starts becoming activism instead of truth, people get off of the concepts of trying to look at it empirically. In this case, every single thing that they, they bring up and talk about the Rodney Meldrum guy so far is just coming at him for this hyper moralistic thing that actually comes from academic construal half of what i think those ac academic critical race theory type construals are is to try to make these not as racist things as the past racism just as racist as ever after they make those construals they get into this moralistic thing and then they get off entirely their their whole world where they could have just challenged the stuff empirically and and taken it down and, and and that's what they used to do in mormonism but there is a level of that where i understand as a person who was around it back in the day when it was all just kind of looking at historical or empirical truths logistical truths that that didn't work so well on people the moral outrage and the moral panic works on people i was telling you about it somebody listening here might have seen it but years ago they got some video of a general authority answering the CES letter questions. This was the moment I saw it change and I knew it was changing. John DeLynn and the person who got the video and Lindsay Hanson Park all got together in a room to watch this video of this guy answering the CES letter or attempting to answer the CES letter. The whole entire podcast got derailed entirely because Lindsay Hanson Park stopped it and said, this shouldn't be focusing on these dumb old historical empirical things that's a male way of thinking that's a that's that's how she said it um i can't prove it because they took down this podcast entirely but that's what that's how I, she I, said I, it. I don't even doubt it i don't even doubt it it's like that looking at that smithsonian thing that they put out where it was like we need to dismantle certain elements of whiteness like punctuality and and aspiration. Exactly. and there was tons of people watching it live because it was like they were looking their chops like we got a general authority to answer the ces questions and they just started, they, they, the whole podcast got derailed. I knew about Foucault and it's almost like nobody else did. And I, I knew like the, the game she was playing on and the way she was turning it into identity right there. But especially like four or five years ago, I remember Delin just like a deer in the headlights, just like, uh, uh, brilliant, brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I guess we'll stop the podcast <laughs> then. Uh, I guess we'll stop. The, that's so brilliant. That's so brilliant. Brilliant. brilliant you know? <laughs> And it's like he was short circuiting, and all he could do is uh, spout out the word "brilliant" in it. And then I'm they, they thinking that that's that's almost my prediction for the last Rod Meldrum thing is that because at the end of it he said, "Well, we knew I didn't know this was going to be about race, but we knew we should have had a person of color on the panel." Oh, you really? You didn't know it was going to be about race? <laughs> so he'll bring some people of color on his panel, and then yeah, exactly halfway through it, chastise him about racism again. But you know what? This is super uncomfortable, and I, as a white, straight, cis, hetero man, I, I, I have to back away from this. <laughs> yeah. So I, I showed it to you, too. I won't pull it up right here, but watch. I pulled it up in other podcasts. But 39 minutes into the Midnight Mormons Kate Kelly thing, she describes the whole entire thing out, too. She says, males just want to get into history and want to get the empiricism stuff, and that's, that's not the female way of taking it in. I think it's kind of funny how they even make those binaries, because I think there's plenty of women who... <laughs> You know, I think Marty is a person who entirely would 
want to look at empirical claims. Well, the fact that it being true or not is more important than if it's mean, right? <laughs> well, that's, that's the whole issue is it's all flipped around. This channel started on the Jonathan hate video of there is a hard line when stuff gets all activistic and it's all about the heart, it's going to start getting fudgy with truth or even not care about truth. And then if stuff's just based in truth, it's going to have to be a little bit detached and not so into the ethics. And that's why I'm pointing at that academic, even his read off thing was all just ethical concerns. It wasn't even, Hey, uh, my, yeah, I've got some issues that, that this stuff can be debunked inside and out left and right. As far as the areas of land you're talking about, or your claims to DNA, he did talk about DNA earlier in that video, but one of the things he brought up about that DNA is, is he thought the Mormons view of how DNA and how race comes, comes from DNA technically is a racist way of viewing things, which I think that's a little bit ridiculous because what he does is he does the thing of saying they got that wrong. And when they got that wrong, some people somewhere use those ideas or concepts to be racist. And because they got some science wrong, and then that science being wrong was used for racism, then the science itself, that bad science technically itself was racism. So like some bad science that you can get wrong is like if, say, you were to make the claim that shaving a gorilla would it would have skin whiter than you. I, I still wonder about that. Cause I even tried to look it up afterwards. The uh, video with Thomas Murphy and Steven, he, he repeats it again. And he's, he, that guy says gorillas have pink skin underneath and chimps have pink skin. underneath. And, and so I looked at a bunch of videos and I don't think anybody's ever properly shaved one. So, so <laughs> I just like making fun of him. He still got into the level of saying that, it, that there's some racism and misunderstanding DNA and how DNA correlates or doesn't to race. And uh, anyway, let's listen more to that. Now, rather than unpack this lengthy paragraph, I'll just summarize. If you are native, Polynesian, black, Mexican, Spanish, Asian, or any person of color and are not actively involved 24 seven in dismantling this so-called invisible system of white supremacy and engaged in constant critical self-reflection that challenges your own unearned privileges, then you're not safe. You are also by definition, a white supremacist. Welcome to the party. Now, some of you may be trying to find some wiggle room and may be thinking there's no way that this is a lifelong process because that sounds too eerily religious and devotional. Well, I'll leave. He's, he's talking to native Americans here. You know, he, he's definitely gearing his thing towards Native Americans. And, and he's right that even Native Americans have that on their head every single morning, that original sit every single morning. And so if Native Americans even have it after he's read all of the information, uh, think about how much John and Kara still have. It. <laughs> Are Native Americans now considered white adjacent? They're, everything's white adjacent if, if they're successful or do well or don't hold up the precepts or the concepts. Nah. You, get, you get called white adjacent or um, there's another term for it. They called it like a brown complicity. That's a, that's their real terminology. Brown I, guess complicity. They, I guess they realize that the term Uncle Tom is too like racially charged now. Like <laughs> they get insulted when we say you have to have this opinion based on your skin color. So we got to need, we need another term for it now. That's the thing too, where the a black person will be considered capital B black or lowercase b black. Their cap will be black if they have the right beliefs and are black. If they're black and have the wrong beliefs, you're not black, man. Oh, that Thomas Soul crap. Yeah. That for you to decide. But here's Robin D'Angelo in her own words, interrupting the forces of racism is ongoing lifelong work because the forces conditioning us into racist frameworks are always at play. Our learning will never be finished. Now. So I brought that up a couple of times last video. Just wanted to get the clip from him here. Mostly just talking about that. It's never done. You never really beat it. John Dillon's not better than Rodney Meldrum, according to these, uh, these academic theories, but then also pointing out that the academic theory has this construal of what white supremacy is. It's kind of a problem because they're destroying words to the point yeah. where white supremacy just doesn't mean anything to anybody.
So now you got like you go to 4chan now and they're like, no, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with being a white supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that's that's what happens. That's the consequence of all of it. Since years ago, one of the biggest things that I was saying to people is you're going to get major right wing pushback on this. And then if if you want that, you know, more power to you. But yeah, I'm not super stoked about when the pendulum swings back the other way. Exactly. Half of the worry is the pendulum swinging back, which is what technically happened with Hitler after Weimar Germany. This is the Mott and Bailey. We talk about a whole lot that there's a, there's a word and it has two meanings, like white supremacy, and uh, or any one of their their concepts or ideas. And the Bailey is the word when it's doing its most action, but it's indefensible. You know that, that you're calling every single thing in, in in our culture white supremacy, but but uh, as soon as you challenge them on that and say, wait, when did you change it to this definition of every single thing in our culture is white? This academic definition, the academic definition is actually the Bailey. You know that that everything can be construed as white hegemony, which is a word that comes from Gramsci, but then was used a lot by Foucault hegemonic discourse you remember discourse from from jonathan's podcast the word discourse kind of means it doesn't exactly mean words and text it does but it's kind of got this more metaphysical magical view like it's everything you know hegemonic discourse is all of our whole entire soup that we are swimming in is white supremacy and it must be dismantled at all times every single day and so then if you challenge them on that and say, isn't that a big extreme to call that all white racism or white supremacy? And I actually remember the moment that they changed it to white supremacy officially, because they used to always use the word hegemony. And it was actually Jonathan Haidt. I remember Jonathan Haidt gave a warning, like, watch out, this year they're changing the word hegemony to white supremacy officially, and they'll just stick on it. Now it's all just white supremacy. What we're in is white supremacy. It was always their intent, but it used to mean the Mott definition, which is what we grew up thinking of what white supremacists are like, I don't know, David Duke or, or yeah. whatever. At some point in time, they knew that everybody, everybody understood white supremacy this way, the Mott version. And when they went around saying it, they said, oh no, but I've got this very strategic academic view. And, and it's the same thing that Thomas Murphy did right in that interview with Stephen of saying, I want to be specific and clear and say that what I'm talking about here is this academic version of his ideas come from racist things and that's technically racist. Now, I think it's dubious that even the academics are that good at, just like he said, Robin DeAngelo says this, it's, it's systems, not people. They're not good. Even the academics themselves are not good at holding that line. But well, Robin DeAngelo is not very good because she does. I, you're, I'm actually glad you explained this. I, I hear the Mott and Bailey reference all the time. I've never really had it explained to me, but um, she does that and she yeah. does it poorly. Like it, it's so transparent. I think everyone needs to read White Fragility so, because she does that all the time throughout the book. She talks about how, yeah, all white people are racist. And I don't understand why the white people get bothered when you call them racist. That they should be excited for the opportunity to grow and stuff like that. And she's, you know, in in her definition, then as soon as somebody needs to be canceled, all of a sudden it's the old definition of racism again. Yeah, as soon as they get challenged on it, or as soon as it starts getting wide variety notoriety, like CRT started getting in the news, they they retreat to the mot, retreat to the mot, retreat to the mot. This is some of the things that are kind of the same as like same vocabulary, different dictionary. That's an old Marxist saying. It's true with most Marxism. There's the two different versions of it. There's the intense version that's not defensible, but causes that that's where you do your damage. That's where you, that's where you're aggressive. That's where you do your business. But when you're getting attacked, retreat to the mot, retreat to the mot. One of the deals with it is that they go and use it. They use it knowing that there's this thing and then you get upset about it thereby causing the fragility. Like they go cause the fragility in you because they know that they're they're making you think of this and you go, I'm not this, I'm not the, uh, I'm not David Duke. And well, I was talking about this, don't you get it? You don't understand it. You don't get it, the strategic <laughs> obfuscation. So you saw him do it a little bit there with Steven where he does this strategic move that's, that's done in all of academia nowadays. He also gets into a lot, he talks a lot about, uh, post-colonial theory 
decolonization and post-colonial theory. We're going to get to that with Jonathan Streeter. That's one of the uh, whole chapters of, yeah. of that book, Cynical Theories. And um, so this is something I shared with Stephen. This was, I think I showed it to you just yesterday out of a, this it book. It's called Ethnic Studies. The like, I think it's like Cultural Ethnic Studies for Kids or something. It's just another book. It's not that big of a deal because there's a million of these books out there right now. But this is this is the extent case. I, I'm using it to make a point here. And this book states in it something pretty extreme. It says this book is written in English, a linguistic vestige of settler colonialism and white supremacy. They're going to be academic. I'm saying the academic white, white supremacy right there in the United <laughs> States. It is the language of the victors, and it was used to carry out attempted cultural genocide. We recognize that when we use English to communicate, we are fundamentally bound by the politics of racism, patriarchy, sexism, capitalism, and colonization buried within the English language. Those pre-demonized words. Yeah. And so this is just saying that the English language is racist. Now, take a step back and think about what they're saying is racist about Rodney Meldrum. Now, there are the stuff that we've always said we've had, like everybody's had a little bit of issues. Even even the most believing of Mormons has had issues with some of these concepts in, in the Book of Mormon. But they're painting it like Rodney Meldrum's doing some sort of extra thing. He's not doing any extra thing. He's saying that I think it happened in the United States. They make the construal of saying happening in the United States plays to the favor of nationalists. Oh, that must be added to excess racism or, or a reason for them to be white supremacists or national supremacists, according to our definitions of why things can fall in a certain way. It's the same thing. What's that guy's name? Murphy guy? Tom, Thomas Murphy, yeah. Thomas Murphy, yeah. That's, well, he, he mentioned that. Basically, it, one of the things he briefly mentioned in his scripted denial of Rod, Rod Meldrum was uh, the implied... Uh, it, it putting guilt on the ancestors of the Native Americans for, for an implied genocide which never took place. Yeah, and that's just saying that, that Rodney Meldrum is in trouble for the Book of Mormon. I know. He believes the Book of Mormon. Genocide took place in the Book of Mormon, and he's saying, well, I think the Book of Mormon happened here. It's like, oh, you think these people did the genocide. And so then they extrapolate and pl place the whole entire of the extent thing, like the whole extreme thing on his head and say that he's He's helping doing this. So then they put him in this, uh, it's almost kind of like a Chinese finger trap place, which they're doing to all, all the Mormons all the time of saying, hey, you need to denounce your prophet and denounce your religious beliefs entirely or you're a full-on racist. And at the same time, they're saying that he needs to be respectful of the religious ideas of the Native Americans or wherever, that surely all of them in their own don't line up to all the modern perfect scientific things but then that's where it gets postmodern. that's where the special pleading comes in the, the mormons can't do it but the native americans can do it i'm just annoyed <laughs> <laughs> watching so much of this rod mildred stuff this is this isn't even that much of a thing but this is a benjamin boys people should listen to the whole entire thing but she talks about how like leftists i guess you could say appropriated the concept of two spirit and um, <laughs> let me show it here. Communities that just don't have doctors. What, what would decolonization deliver if I, if my grandmother cannot? Well, it would insulin? free them from the enlightenment uh, imagination's idea of sex binaries. It would, it would free you guys ah, from yes. the idea of sex. Yes, right? so yes, that. yes. The, the, the famous two spirits that um, I never heard of <laughs> until. <laughs> 2005 2006 never okay. heard of it um, i heard it was i i haven't looked into that but i heard it was kind of actually invented in some sort of academic context yes um, uh, i traditional. just i just looked this up pretty recently um and it was made the, the term two-spirit i believe comes from uh, an ojibwe word i think uh, which is very far away from my that's minnesota dakota's area okay um it was first used in english and like 97 or something like that in an academic setting you're absolutely right um i i, I think it was a native it, she, i i won't say it was a non-native because it may well have been a native person um very uh new that really um i i want to say i didn't hear about it until 2005 um 
when I probably, I, I remember because I asked, I, I specifically remember asking an elder about it because I had heard about it and I was wondering why I had not previously heard of this concept. Mm -hmm. And the person had absolutely no idea what I was mm -hmm. referencing. <laughs> There's a lot they, of uh, concept creep. So you have a going? Creep like that, that kind of is appended. It was, it, it's almost like it's some certain strain of the academy is colonizing the natives for uh, the academy's colonizing the natives and that's part of the whole entire concept of the noble savage thing that even that thomas murphy guy gets into about saying nothing that rodney meldrum believes no matter how untrue it is is acceptable because he's a white american you know the, those ideas are just verboten but we must accept everything or even appropriate some of the concepts of uh of the native americans for for our activism but he also just gets into like a long thing about oh, i think it's racist that he appropriates some of the ideas from the native americans like saying these mounds were for this other thing that's appropriate you're taking that idea away from the native americans for what the real thing was but that's <laughs> it's exactly happening in academia left and right all over the place well that's like i, I think it's a stupid guess but it's a guess like it, it makes it sound like when you're trying to dis if you discover an ancient civilization and you try to figure out what this thing was used for in the ancient civilization if you were wrong about that if you happen to be wrong about your hypothesis then now yeah. you're wrong you're racist so now, now there's this yeah there's this ethical moral thing that if you're wrong about your science that's a racism, you know, they, they can point, well, because it had some sort of negative effect on modern day people or something like that, but, but that's like all in, what it is. It's, it's the risk of being wrong. Like you have to risk being wrong in order to even have a hypothesis. Yeah. But Rodney's not allowed to even dare to do it because he's supposed to be up to date with all their, their ethical standards at those uh, universities, which that's one of the reasons Jordan Peterson quit the university. Gad Sad talks about it a whole lot. He said it in his exit letter is that you can't even do science anymore in any sort of way. You can't even go look at the empiricism of anything because even trying to go about doing it is so steeped in ethical bullcrap around it that just like I said, to go back and listen to what Thomas Murphy's red complaint about Meldrum is there. It's all religious, ethical, quasi-religious academia. Yeah. This uh, is yeah. This is, you, you said you were thinking like a name for your podcast, but I was kind of, it wouldn't work because it's too goofy sounding, but I always thought my, my podcast name could be something like Pomo, no Pomo. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm, po I'm post-Mormon and now I'm a post, post-modern, post-modern, post-Mormon now, post-post-modern, you know, type stuff. <laughs> because all the uh, academic stuff is just, it is all, it, it, it was so mind-blowing. All the, all the different Mormons who had like their moments of, I can't believe that all this stuff was as dubious as I never knew it was this dubious. I've had all those same mo moments in academia, if not even worse, you know, like, I can't believe this is this is all what they're doing and what they're leaning into. And see the the name I, for my channel is um, it'll be just as insightful as that because it's an Ayn Rand reference. It's Saint of the Player <laughs> from, uh, from right, that, that cut for a second. What was that Saint? Saint of the Pyre from Anthem. Oh, nice, nice. Did you read Anthem? Yeah, oh, I haven't read it, but I heard an overview of it. Hmm. That's it's pretty short. It's one of my favorites, and that saint of the pie that you or I is the forbidden word because it's supposed to be taking collectivism to its logical conclusion. Yeah, and yeah. Nobody, nobody uses first person pronouns, and finally, that's. Yeah. I mean, she's she's pressing on some stuff. I heard her in the eighties giving the speech about how these. Uh, corporations were going to sink themselves by taking up all these uh activistic charity angles and, and i think at that time it must have sounded nuts and then whenever somebody says something that nuts and then it starts happening that that to me i is what i feel comfortable calling being a prophet in different ways yeah. Yeah. But to, to try to you, you sift it through a modern lens of gender yes. or all these other different things well, I think it, this actually um, loops back to the question, the, the topic you brought up, up about um, 
how race in the U.S. is very much about black and white, right? As human beings and as contemporary um, con contexts. But natives are very useful as symbols, right? Where the I and BIPOC were very useful. And um, we're not very useful as people, but, but our culture and our concepts are very useful. Um, and the two-spirit place example is a perfect um, embodiment of that, right? Arguing that actually the Native Americans had this concept, all of us, every single Native American across North America had the same exact cultural attitudes towards gender, apparently. Um, we even use the same word for it, according to this, you know, this belief in this argument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that references back to that we are very useful as symbols, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody's really looked into the absurdity of the idea that every tribe would have had the same concept or what are contemporary attitudes towards homosexuality or two spirits on different reservations today. Mm -hmm. um, it, do natives today want to be affiliated with that concept? Do they confirm? Does anyone under the age of 40, over the age of 40, confirm that this is a traditional concept that they were aware of? Um, but it's useful. Mm -hmm. So um, it gets used. Maybe maybe D'Angelo's right. Maybe just both both uh, Thomas Murphy and Rod Meldrum are just infinitely racist, and they have to endlessly deconstruct it. Well, Two spirit uh, always to me. That one seems like such a reach to sort of marry post colonialism with queer theory. <laughs> yeah. Like oh, we need to put we need to put something post colonial related into the acronym. Let's let's find this obscure thing that nobody believes in. It's always so full of that noble savage stuff. I mean, I think that's what I was saying to Stephen is that that noble savage savage stuff can be deconstructed as a racist construct as much as anything. Well, it's got to be. It's got to be feel like a little pandering. But... John Lynn said we needed to denounce racism in all its forms, <laughs> even the pandering. It's just gonna eat itself. Yeah. You just look at this. This is. On new discourses, some decolonize, some issues on what you got to decolonize. If you look at all the books Thomas Murphy suggested, it's all decolonized colonization. Colonial, post colonial theory largely started with Eastern, like Indian. Um, it was Edward Said who, who started up, and I can never say their names. Uh, Chuck Spivak, Chuck Brabarti, I can't say their names, but they're, they're uh, fully oh, Freudian. Yeah, yeah, fully, yeah. exactly. Foley Foucaultian type type people and and got into the whole entire thing and then all this stuff got transferred later to the Americas. That's one of the things they'll say that you'll hear a bunch of ex Mormons say that missionaries going out into the world are, are colonizing or being colonizers. Yeah, I found that out. Um, I I had people in a different like an unrelated to Mormonism group. They talked about missionary work and i was like yeah i did that stuff for a while they're like do you feel guilty about it i was like no i feel like i wasted two years because it sucked it was boring but why did i feel guilty and they're like well because uh you colonized them i was like i was in brazil okay it, it's uh, really been colonized like i'm in southern brazil and, and a lot of there's a lot of germans there <laughs> what do you mean I colonize them. They already believe in Jesus. They're Catholic for the most part. Well, that's because they were already colonized. It's all it's all post. Yeah, post but do I gotta for recolonizing them? I'm just saying, like I I'm just just <laughs> on top of colonialism. Yeah, you're guilty. You're guilty, but but that's that's the D'Angelo thing is we're all guilty of it in all times and all ways of being in all moments. Um, it, but where does that where where does that start you off then? Like where what should we just be all completely segregated as people and never take anything from other cultures at all and never give anything to other cultures? Like, cause it, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 it's impossible. They set up an impossible scenario and in a scenario that you should just whip yourself over if you try to act in the world at all. But look, if you see this, it's all loaded up with uh, the words we know now from uh, the Jonathan Streeter podcast, the power, knowledge, power, knowledge, <laughs> those Foucauldian words. Same vocabulary, different dictionary, power, knowledge, the Foucauldian concepts of them, which are basically power, knowledge is another term for white supremacy. You know, it's hegemony, which is the white supremacy right now. Deconstruct, decolonization is therefore best understood as a deconstructive and reconstructive project with the social justice to remove white and Western influences or, or centrality from essentially any and everything. And it's 
one of the reasons they call that book cynical theories is because they know that they're jamming. They know that they're messing with it. They know that you're, they're irritating the culture and they know that they've set up an impossible, you know, first sin, primary sin, um, gift of forgiveness type, infinite sinning type stuff, um, from Mormonism. Well, it's, it's the lack of forgiveness. I always call it a religion without a savior. Yeah. Do you know that book? Did you have gift of forgiveness on your mission? <laughs> the miracle of forgiveness? Miracle of forgiveness. That's why I said the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, we, we weren't. It was already banned by then? No, they weren't supposed to really, but my mission president was a, a kind of an exceptional asshole. And so he, <laughs> so he gave it to one him. of my companions to read and. Yeah, so that's kind of like the Robin DiAngelo book from that side. It's it's the yeah, uh, it infinite is. the infinite sin thing. You must be doing it at all times and all moments, or you're a part of the problem. You're part of the sin. You're you're on the Satan side. So you've probably heard we have to decolonize everything. We have to decolonize books. We have to decolonize the curriculum in our schools and universities. We have to decolonize the workplace. We probably have to decolonize whatever your profession is, graphic design or whatever it is. We have to decolonize everything. So what does it mean to decolonize? And so decolonize is an important term to understand. The way that the critical social justice activists think, what they actually believe is that Western civilization, by virtue of how successful it has been at uh, making things work in society and elevating uh, the standard of living and also uh, spreading around the globe, has essentially colonized the entire world in the way that the world thinks, just like colonialism of uh, centuries gone by. They think that the very ideas, the ways of thinking, the what we consider knowledge, how we get to truth, is all colonizing the rest of the world. And what we have to do is decolonize, so they say, which is to say we have to remove enlightenment rationalism and the other principles of the liberal order and Western civilizational thought from everything, everywhere, and replace it with other things uh, that come from other traditions, which on the face sounds good, but we're talking about removing high level classics if it's in books we're talking about decolonizing methodologies so maybe in engineering if we we're going to decolonize engineering we're going to go away from methods that work like statics and mechanics and basic physical laws to other ways of considering that that might have come from other cultures decolonizing basically means removing every vestige of western liberal and enlightenment thought from everything and replacing it with other things especially when those things present a critical consciousness that will cause people to think about society in the way that critical social justice activists want them to. If you want to understand more about the manipulations of language that appear in the critical social justice movement, visit newdiscourses.com and check out translations from the wokish. How do you decolonize the Book of Mormon? Is <laughs> that's well, that's ultimately what it is. It, listen to the entire interview with Stephen. And he says, "Well, how does this guy? How will the academic community ever accept you if you completely decolonize the Book of Mormon? How do you how?" It, it always leads down to that point. It's, it was even brought up in the Delin episode with Meldrum of how, how do I do that? I have to denounce my prophets and I have to denounce the Book of Mormon and I have to, no, no, no. Well, then how? But it seems so clearly yeah, though. Yeah, what, I guess. Yeah, know, yeah, I guess. It was, he was pushing him. He's like, okay, I win either way. Either this way, I get him to say my beliefs are all nonsense. This way, I get him to say I'm just a blatant racist. Either way, yeah. I win. It's juicy. I get more clicks. But, yeah. but he's, at, he's actually very good on his feet, not good at trapping people. So he, <laughs> yeah. Rod was just like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I don't think he, I don't think Shit. Delin, I don't think Delin got the, I think he was trying to get a viral moment out of it and tried to get him to denounce one or the other and he didn't get it out of it. But they, the whole entire thing is putting them, I keep saying Chinese finger trap. It's not the caca trap, but they, they try to put them in these, uh, these double binds where, you know, they can't get out of it. They've got to either denounce their religion entirely or, or accept that they're terrible, horrible racists. And False dichotomy. There's, there's praxis in that, like heavy duty, big time, major, major praxis. And I think that uh, Thomas Murphy did the same thing in this, in Stephen's episode, just, and, he, and then he advocated that maybe you should take up learning these native American religions and you'll, you'll be a better person for it or something like that. And uh, all under the air, and this is one of my bigger points, all under the air of academia, which they are slightly more careful. You get, you get any sort of academics like that, they are slightly more careful. But then 
one game of telephone, pass it off to an activist, John DeLynn, like they might be a little bit more careful in being truly Foucauldian of, of really being systems, not people. You pass it off one level to any activist and it gets full-blown accusatory, full-blown uh, smear merchant crap. Go two levels and it's just off the charts, <laughs> you know. Well, you look uh, at nobody... the Melder video. It's, it's full of people who just assume that he espouses that because Dylan kept asking him, well, what about this terrible belief? Do you believe that? And he's like, I don't know what the answer is. And people just, all of the people in the comments were like, I can't believe that he espouses those beliefs. We yeah, he stuck with it. They, they, he successfully pinned it on him. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like they don't understand that there is, um, their agenda is further by him expressing those views. So it's like they don't understand that, well, okay, even if you're not being insincere, it would be advantageous for you in this instance to be insincere and to pin a belief on him that he doesn't actually hold. Yeah. Because they are, well, why would we do that? <laughs> well, the first thing the first thing he hoped for was to actually get the soundbite of him saying something that was sufficiently Brad Wilcoxy, which even mm -hmm. that wasn't the full daydream that they, they thought it was. But that's his white whale, man. That's he's gonna <laughs> get some more Brad Wilcoxes till the day he dies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'm gonna do one more little clip for 10 seconds and then we'll just look at the Lynn's last little on the episode again of him doing the bad praxis where it goes away from the theoretical into the practice, and then you guys screw up being so good at systems, not people, and you start being accusatory. This one's just 10 second clip. Three definitions, critical race theory, noun. One, calling everything one wants to control racist until it is fully under your control. That's it. That's all you need. Critical race theory is if you want to control something, you call it racist until you control it. That's all it is. <laughs> I should pull like that clip out and just put it after like every single one of those times that they start doing it. But let me see if uh, I thought I found this moment in the last little clip with the Meldrum and Lynn, just go back to it. And I wanted to look at uh, what you pointed out of the uh, show notes. Uh, uh, yeah, you go to the chapters and it's really sanctimonious. Like, Dylan demands explanation for racism. <laughs> yeah, I want to look at those real quick. <laughs> oh, this Dylan character is a good man. <laughs> I think it comes down to was with Brigham Young speaking as that, you know, thus saith the Lord God Almighty, uh, the black people are blah, 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 blah. Or is he speaking as his own personal opinion? But then why wouldn't you say and in so, Br Brigham Young's own personal opinion, he could have been racist and that those yeah. sayings were racist? Okay. But because then, because then the, the response from you would be, well, if he was racist and he was a prophet, then... No, no, that actually blah, blah, wouldn't blah. be my response. Okay. You think that wouldn't be his response? That I think that's actually that was like, look, I know what you're doing here, man. <laughs> I think I think that no, it wouldn't be my response is a straight lie by Delin. I think that's yeah, just absolutely like, that's a lie. <laughs> uh, I that's it, what I would expect that your response would be. Uh -uh, no, no, no. That I means, can, like, he's not a prophet because he has racist ideas. No, nope, no. Nope. It it all depends on what your definition of a prophet is, but I know. <laughs> <laughs> getting into some uh redefinitions there Redefin redefining is how we make it all work you know, lots of progressive mormons and me before i got kicked yeah. out of the church i would have said a prophet can be anyone who's trying to say and do good things and they can be super flawed and yeah. still be prophets of god yeah which, which brings me to another another say and no. do good things what a what a <laughs> pathetic they would they would prophet dude <laughs> Meldrum is absolutely right. That is a trap. They would absolutely use it for. Well, and I love the shock on his face. He's like, I feel like if, like, if I were to say this, that you you're going to respond by asking how he's a prophet, and <laughs> Delisa, oh, me? <laughs> I wouldn't. Let's see the show notes. You uh, pretty good. You get to the last ones, and it's all. Oh like, my gosh! Every single one of them. Well. Beliefs in God, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, pre-existence, families, creation, spirit, children, polygamy, Jesus and the Trinity, war in heaven. 
what John hoped Rod would say about why racism is. <laughs> <laughs> Color of skin as it occurs, John asks Rod to answer the question directly. John, um, he's the hero. John's a very big hero. When I listened to that, I was like, oh, he must get fierce with him. He doesn't get fierce. He just keeps pushing. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the stuff that he has to prove to his uh, constituents or whatever you call them, his uh, viewers, that oh, I took him on. I tested him. That's why I could have him on the show. Um, Not good enough for John Larson, unfortunately. I wonder what John Larson is saying right now because he could be just going off on whatever other thing. I, I'm going to jump right on that as soon as this is over. That, that's honestly what the deal is. That's this, this whole podcast started because John Larson and I had a back and forth and um, – I already went into it on another podcast, but one of the things I was pointing to him is that I was around in 2007, 2008, when you guys were doing your stuff and you guys have adopted these new academic theories. And I know that wasn't part of your understanding back then because I knew about them and you guys didn't know about them yet. So you've had, you've had a baptism at some point in the middle of there. And I also know that you guys can't stray too far away from the orthodoxies. The whole reason for this whole podcast is because John Lynn has to play to the orthodoxies. He knows he has to come at him this way, or he could be uh he canceled himself, or it could turn on him for for hosting a possibly racist guy because he thinks the Book of Mormon happened in the Americas. I, 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 well, and that's that's most Mormons, like because a lot of them never really think of you know, oh well, there's not really there's some problems with evidence of what we say happened. Most of them just kind of assume that, that they go their entire lives. So most of them could just be racist by happenstance, but, uh, oh man, I love that one, that taking no responsibility for white male privilege. <laughs> we have to listen to that one. That'll be the last one we click on here. Why do I keep reading? God's mouthpiece can have slaves. Would he call Brigham Young a racist by all the things he said? Mormon beliefs are that are, are wrong. Prophets are racist, but can still be a prophet. Racism is uncomfortable for him to admit. Rod says, yes, by today's standards, Brigham Young was racist. Racism discussion, natural happenings or what God wants, taking no responsibility for white male privilege. <laughs> Deflect, like, but that, that's such like a religious request. Like, I know. join our religion or... Well, and he does, it, he does it very uh, penitently. John Dillon asks him... Like, oh, uh, well, I have to say, as also a straight white uh, yeah. cisgender male, that blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> Taking no responsibility for white male privilege, deflection when answering the racist male privilege. In 2022, racism is still alive now, and thoughts on now and racism. Racist policy for years, LDS Church plays into racism. Isn't the policy being denounced enough? Good, good versus evil arguments. One true church prophets. John asking Ron to admit the mistakes and steps of repentance. Racist. That part, that part is insane to me. That's him. That, that is John DeLynn. In that part, he like yeah. telling Rob, why don't you take the steps to, re why don't we take the steps to repentance? This, this <laughs> is a laid out here. It's a laid out struggle session. This is a I struggle know. session. Like, uh, good versus evil arguments. One true church prophet. John asking Rod to admit the mistakes and steps of repentance. Racist theories. Can we right the wrongs? John's view of history and racism condemns them. Kara trying to help Rod understand privilege. Oh, <laughs> trying to help. That was so condescending. That's so nice of her. <laughs> it was so condescending. It's such a... They always talk good. about mansplaining. We always have these woke splainers to... I know. Rod's final comment on racism. We can do better wrapping up for this episode, denouncing racism. What to look forward to on the next episode. Denouncing um, racism. I've never experienced more secondhand embarrassment for a person in my life. <laughs> <laughs> a greater responsibility to, to help your fellow man. So, I mean, who, who was it that actually pushed through and, and got basically worldwide the idea of slavery being being a bad thing primarily whites well we don't want to give white people okay. credit I don't no, think. No, I don't we can't, we can't give white people to... any credit for any technology advances that have blessed the lives of everybody throughout the entire world but that's a deflection but, people... but that's a deflection that's, deflection. that's it, a deflection from same... us taking responsibility for the as white straight heterosexual <laughs> european descent males. you've been blessed if we're deflecting it should... to look at all the great things white people have done 
Uh, it's such. Uh... That's what I always point out when I, when I talk about these things. It's I'm I'm expected to feel the collective all of us are... and collective <laughs> responsibility for things that I didn't do. But yeah, and you mentioned the pride, collective pride. Then I'm I'm a white supremacist, which I think collective pride is stupid. I'm I'm not proud of the Wright brothers for like I'm not proud of the same race as the Wright brothers because I didn't I don't lay any claim to their invention of the plane. I'm, well, both of both of my grandfathers fought in World War II. I'm I'm proud of them. I didn't fight in World War II. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, it, there's it, nothing it, about it, me that fought in World War II. Yeah, I'm, I am grateful. I am humble by are, the achievements of those that came before me. I'm not. Those are family uh, members too. Those those aren't even people who just tangentially share a race with me. And if I remember right, I think World War II was against other whites. So uh, <laughs> it might have been. Just, yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's just it's such an impossible quandary. And the the issue of it is is. Sure, there's more to maybe figure out and get right about all this stuff, but the way these things are going are so ass backwards. They're so not the way to do it. There's even so many of those different like modern day um, race sensitivity trainings. They even have data to show that they make things worse, not better. They make people feel more resentful, and more racist. Than, but that's part of the critical eye is you're supposed to... to ex bring the conflict through you're supposed to accelerate the contradictions you're supposed to like this guy his whole life growing up he's probably just a mormon probably didn't think that much of the racism thing and so it was up to the critical theorists to come give you the critical eye and make you see it and make you see the great big problem which so much of it in in my lifetime and and probably most of his lifetime especially like in the salt lake area larger city area the stuff had just been so squashed down to like, they, it was more of like a forgotten, don't talk about that issue because it used to be in the past. But if there was issues going on right currently inside of Salt Lake City, they would have come up. The problem is, is it just, it just didn't, it didn't come up. Like you didn't think about it. You didn't have to address the racism in the past church because it just didn't come up. You didn't know about it as a young kid. Yeah. And I, I guess I do have to admit my bias here is that I immediately had a soft spot for uh, Meldrum because he sounds exactly like Dale Gribble. <laughs> Anybody who gets put on the spot or gets starts getting harangued like this, but part of it is too, is like as a libertarian thinker myself who believes in the First Amendment, I believe this guy has a right to his beliefs as much as those Native Americans have a right to their beliefs, even though there's going to be backward things in those beliefs. And sure, some of those issues might collide with each other if they both were trying to like use claim to like old dead bodies as part of their religious holdings. But um, I would probably err on the side. You'd probably have to prove it out. But once again, if you get into full critical race theory, they'd say the whole thing of having to prove something out and go through the American system of, of law to decide what some sort of a traditional area belongs to who is in itself white supremacy more. That's why it's just eternal. It's just, it's fractal. Like every level's already, already deconstructed. You, you can't do anything about it. But you can't laugh at people for being obviously wrong. Like it, it's like I, I, a couple of years ago, I was like, I like lurking, learning about absurd things. Let's people are talking about the flat earthers. Let's listen to the flat earthers. I, I can spend about, eight minutes a year lending ear to the flat earthers because then you're just like, oh, this is just too dumb. And <laughs> yeah. it's really passionate about it. There's that uh, ex the Professor Dave Explains YouTube channel. Yeah. And like, I swear to God, 70% of his videos are devoted to flat earthers. And he like gets angry with them. I was like, why are you mad? This is, these people believe dumb things and it just chuckle at it and move on to something else. Like, you don't, and, and, and it's not even just that you can't, I think the Heartland theory is so weird and goofy that your response should be like, that's dumb. You don't have any proof for that. And then um, you don't have to force him to be like, okay, get on your knees and beg forgiveness for having this, uh, this racist idea. Just like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Any sort of concept or idea can be interesting. But then once again, I've seen the uh, deconstructionist deconstruct how, 
that's racist of us to think that you should be able to be disinterested in something and to view some, the history in a disinterested way. That's that's part of our white privilege. That shows my privilege that I didn't <laughs> have ancestors that, that were Native Americans that would be the people accused of the genocide that happened in the Book of Mormon. And therefore, I can't comment on it because my lived experience is different. <laughs> that's uh, impossible but they that's that's part of the deal with it is they've come up with their construal to answer back to every single one of the things you come across any random person they might not know all the construals i know the lynn and larson don't yet know all the construals to, to then go back another layer back and say you don't get it man but part of why i know that is because they don't get that they themselves are already deconstructed they don't get that they <laughs> They don't get to play the game either. You know, but. The Lynn seems to be kind of always a step behind um, where the the woke crowd would want him to be. And he's always sort of doing damage control. I think he's going to be doing damage control for, well, until he's completely canceled, I guess. Yeah, until they topple him, until the circling fire squad gets him, until they, they he says it calls it like crabs in a bucket. But he doesn't, I don't think he quite understands that it's not just a mob and it's not just people getting riled up i don't think he understands that it's in the dumb academia that he should be removed you know he should he's colonized that space you're a colonizer john Nolan. you've colonized it and uh but thomas murphy's also colonized that space and i think he knows that he knows that he has and so he must just be in constant repentance about it at least according to those academic theories if you buy into them and go along with them and think that that stuff's all more pristine than a religion ever was they they can't stop and question academia in itself they're supposed to be the ones who can deconstruct stuff they're supposed to be the ones who could be look at it in a Foucauldian way, but they can never look back at themselves in a Foucauldian way. They can never look back at the academia and say, wait a minute, maybe we're doing a big dumb thing here and, and we're, <laughs> we're hooked up into a bunch of wackadoodle ideas and we're colonizing a space with our, a lot of people call the, those woke ideas as like a new type of colonialism. And now they're trying to spread it to the world. They're trying to go and bring it to Afghanistan and go and bring it to a, uh, uh, the Ukraine and whatever. And it's a new, like we said in the Jonathan Streeter podcast, there's little bits of truth in all this. When James Lindsay calls it the ironclad law of woke projection. And it's just true that the, you guys are the ones still trying to colonize it. You guys are the ones still taking up the space. You guys are the ones pushing your, your luxury ideas on, on, you know, people not, not ready to be accepting of those ideas or, you know, like Latinx concepts or, Native Liberty was just saying there that they've got to help deconstruct white supremacy at all times. And uh, the interest convergence, that's Derek Bell, who says, if you make any sort of profit, like you getting behind any sort of one of these movements plays towards your gain. And that's the only reason you're getting into it. And that's true. That's true of those uh, academic leftists, John Dillon, John Larson types, or uh, they're all there's very frequently, they're only doing it because it plays to their gain. And so you're like, well, kudos to you, Derek Bell, you got it. But I mean, I think I know a lot of white people who, who were behind the Civil Rights Act because they thought blacks had civil rights. But yeah. I agree with you that there's certain parties that say, hey, we can make, we can make hay out of this. <laughs> All right. Anything else to say? Anything to promote? You're gonna, when are you going to do the, uh, when are you going to start with your thing? I don't know. I got to do it soon, though, for all this. Meldrum stuff is still relevant. I'm going to take a bunch of notes. I, I think I want to do something that's not super. I want to do a format that isn't difficult to edit, but I think this first thing I want to do is probably going to be more of a video essay type thing. I don't know. That'd be good. Sweet, man. Thanks. I hope yeah. I bet you, I might not listen to Larson tonight because it will probably irritate me so much. I'll be up all night, but it's not a bad let me know. Idea. Let me know if it's something stupid. All right. Well, I'll go Sweet. check that. Thanks. Yeah, anytime, dude.